Hello, my name is Jake. I am a math tutor from Chicago. This video is called Bounded Sequences and Convergent Subsequences, and it's just going to be some notes that I put together about the bolzano weierstrass theorem from Real Analysis. So, should you watch this? You should watch this if you're already studying Real Analysis, and you've seen some of the basic definitions, so like you know what a sequence is, and you've seen some of the epsilon delta definitions already, and you're interested in reviewing some facts about bounded and convergent sequences of real numbers. So the main focus of this video is going to be the following theorem. It's called the bolzano weierstrass theorem, and it says that every bounded sequence of real numbers has a convergent subsequence. So I'll give a proof of this theorem in a moment, but first I feel like I should review some definitions. So here is uh, some background real analysis. I'm assuming you already know this, but just in case you forgot. A sequence is an infinite list of real numbers. So x1, x2, x3, just an infinite list of numbers like that. Another way to say this is a sequence is a function whose domain is the set of natural numbers and whose codomain is the set of real numbers. So if you think about a function as having inputs and outputs, then when you input the natural number n, the output you get is x sub n, and that's called the nth term of the sequence. And the entire sequence is written in uh, parentheses like this. So x sub n in parentheses means the entire list. All right, uh, subsequences. So given a sequence x sub n, a subsequence of that sequence is a new sequence y sub n that can be obtained from the first sequence by removing terms but not reordering them. So just to try to make that crystal clear, if I've got a sequence I'm calling x1, x2, x3, and so on. Uh, to get a subsequence from the sequence, I'm just going to remove some terms. So I don't want to make it look like there's a pattern. You can just remove them kind of randomly. And then as long as you've got infinitely many terms left over, the leftover terms give you a subsequence. So like x3, you could call that y1, x4, you can call that y2, x6, that would be y3. Whatever terms are left over, that's the subsequence. All right, a sequence is bounded if there are real numbers a and b, so that uh, everything in the sequence is bigger than a but smaller than b. And a sequence is convergent if there is a real number L, so that for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists some natural number N, so that uh, the absolute value of x sub little n minus L is less than epsilon for every little n bigger than big N. It's a mouthful. So the number L is unique, and it's called the limit of the sequence. So I'm going to mention a couple alternative ways to think about bounded sequences and convergent sequences. You can also think about these concepts using intervals. So what do I mean by that? A sequence is bounded if for some a and b in the real numbers, the interval from a to b contains all of the sequence. So if you imagine here's the real number line, and then I've got some sequence like sprinkled in there, uh, it's bounded if there's some interval, some finite length interval from A to B that contains all of the points in the sequence. And a sequence converges to a real number L if every interval that contains L also contains most of the sequence. So the word most here has a technical meaning. It means all but finitely many terms. So this one's worth drawing the picture for. Here's the real line. Here's a sequence, x1, x2, x3, and then it goes off and does something else. But let's say it converges to a limit here. 
anytime I draw an interval around this limit, only finitely many terms get left out of that interval. No matter how small I make the interval, I still catch most of the sequence in the interval. So there's two different ways to think about convergence of a sequence. You can use the epsilon definition, or you can use this uh, every interval contains most of the terms definition. So the first thing to prove is that every convergent sequence is bounded. I'm calling that a theorem, and I'll give the proof here. So the proof goes like this. Let x sub n be a convergent sequence, and let l be the limit. Take epsilon equal to 1 in the definition of convergence. So there has to be some big N so that the absolute value of x sub little n minus l is less than 1 for every little n bigger than big N. Another way to say this is most of the sequence is contained in the interval from l minus 1 to l plus 1. All right. Uh, so let's look at the terms that get left out of that interval. There's only finitely many of them, so we can find an interval from some a to some b that contains all of them. So uh, a could be like the smallest one from this list minus 1, and b could be the biggest one from this list plus 1. Anyways, fix some interval with that property, that it contains the initial terms. And now the union of these two intervals is contained in some larger interval. So uh, I'm going to call the larger interval C comma D. So to really spell it out, you'd want to take C to be the smaller of the two left endpoints and D to be the larger of the two right endpoints. But the point is, the interval from C to D contains the sequence that we started with, so X sub N is bounded. So that's the end of the proof. But just to demystify this as much as I can, all the proof is saying is this. If you've got a convergent sequence, then you can do this. You take the interval of radius 1 centered at the limits. Most of the terms in the sequence wind up here inside the interval of radius 1 centered at the limit. Finitely many of the terms end up outside of that, but there's only finitely many of them. So we've broken this sequence up into two pieces. Both of those pieces are bounded, and so the whole sequence is bounded too. All right, so that's that. So how else do these ideas fit together? For example, is the converse true? Is every bounded sequence convergence? So the answer to that is no. There are lots of sequences that are bounded but do not converge. And the easiest example that I can think of is the repeating sequence that just goes 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. It just keeps repeating like that forever. It is bounded, but it does not converge. So the bolzano weierstrass theorem is sort of like a partial converse. A bounded sequence does not have to converge, but it must have a subsequence that does. That's what the theorem says. All right, now moving on to the proof of the bolzano weierstrass theorem. It takes a little bit of prep work. I'm not ready to start the proof just yet. Uh, I should mention there's many different proofs of the bolzano weierstrass theorem. I'm just going to show one of my favorite proofs. I guess I've got multiple favorite proofs of this theorem, but here's one of my favorites. Uh, it's going to use something called the monotone convergence theorem. And I'm assuming you've already run into that too. If you're studying real analysis, usually you see that pretty early on. So the monotone convergence theorem says every monotone bounded sequence is convergent. And I didn't tell you in this video, so I should remind you, a sequence is monotone if it does not zigzag back and forth. And uh, what I really mean by that is a sequence is monotone means if it ever goes up, it's never allowed to go down. And if it ever goes down, it's never allowed to go up. There's two options for monotone sequences, monotone increasing and monotone decreasing. And the monotone convergence theorem says if you're monotone and you're bounded, then you have to be convergent. 
You can prove the monotone convergence theorem by using the least upper bound property, but that's not what I want to do in this video. I want to use the monotone convergence theorem to prove the Bolzano Weierstrass theorem. So let's do that. Well, now here is one proof of the Bolzano Weierstrass theorem. Let x sub n be a bounded sequence. The goal is to show that it contains a convergent subsequence. So to do this, you have to introduce a new concept. So a term in the sequence is called a peak if uh, it's bigger than or equal to every term that comes after it. And there's two cases. We're going to show that in both cases we can find a monotone sequence. So the first case is that the sequence has infinitely many peaks, and this is the easier case. So in this case, we can take the subsequence of peaks, and that has to be monotone decreasing, because if you've got a peak, then the next peak has to be shorter, because the first peak was a peak, so everything else is shorter, and now you're at this peak, so the next peak after that has to be shorter, and now the next peak after that has to be shorter, and there's infinitely many peaks, so you get this sequence that's monotone decreasing. In case two, we're just going to assume the opposite of what we assumed in case one. So suppose the sequence has only finitely many peaks. So what this means is there has to be some natural number, call it big N, so that the subsequence that starts after that term does not contain any peaks. This is the subsequence we get by starting after all of the peaks are over. So now take y1 to be any term from this subsequence. y1 is not a peak. So that means for some term y sub 2 further along in the sequence, y sub 2 has to be bigger than y sub 1, right? Because if you're not a peak, there's some term after you that's bigger than you. But now y sub 2 is also not a peak because it's in this subsequence where everything is not a peak. And that means there has to be some y sub 3 that's even further than y sub 2 and bigger than y sub 2. And you can keep repeating this. And by doing that, you produce a sequence that's monotone increasing. So just keep adding more terms to the sequence. No term is a peak, so you can always find a term that's bigger that term is not a peak, so you can find a term that's bigger than that, and you get a monotone increasing subsequence. So in either case, the original sequence has a monotone subsequence. In the first case, it was a monotone decreasing subsequence. In the second case, it was monotone increasing. And because the original sequence is bounded, so is the subsequence, and now you've got a monotone bounded subsequence. So the monotone convergence theorem tells you that the subsequence has to be convergent. And that's what we wanted. We found a subsequence that's convergent of the original bounded sequence. And that's the end of the proof. That's one proof of Bolzano-Weierstrass. So here's a couple observations about these proofs that you might find interesting. To show that every convergent sequence is bounded, Here's what we did. We took an infinite sequence and we split it up into two pieces, a tail end and an initial segment. And then we argued that because both pieces are bounded, the whole sequence has to be bounded too. To prove the bolzano weierstrass theorem to show that every bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence, we split things up into two possibilities. A sequence has to have infinitely many peaks, or it has to have finitely many peaks. And then we showed that in either possibility, we get the convergent subsequence that we were looking for. So in analysis, you start to learn how to reason and be logical with infinity, and specifically like infinite sets. And so here's kind of the main point I want to make. Sometimes it's useful to split an infinite problem up into two pieces, an infinite piece and a finite piece. And that's what we did in both of those last two proofs. You can kind of see uh, there's this infinite collection of things that we want to prove something about. So we split that collection into two different pieces, a sort of 
fundamentally infinite piece and a sort of fundamentally finite piece. And that's kind of a, a running theme in analysis. So for example, when we say that pi, the real number pi, is approximately 3.14, we're discarding all but finitely many terms from the decimal expansion 3.14159 dot dot dot. So when you're making an approximation, you are cutting this number up into two pieces, an initial piece, and then like an infinite piece that you know is negligible. I'm sure if you look around, you'll be able to find other examples of this where you're taking like an infinite problem and splitting it up into these two pieces. So uh, if you find something like this and you want to let me know, please do that. I find this kind of thing interesting. And that's a good place to stop, I think. So thanks for watching. I hope something in there was interesting or useful to you. And you should know that I tutor online. So if you're looking for a real analysis tutor, you can get in touch with me through my website. It's herndonmathservices.com. That's all. Bye.